click forty minutes. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another forty and Wakanda user group meeting from Forty Method. Today is August eighth, uh, two thousand eighteen. Uh, on the agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about 4D method again for those who are new joining us. Um, we'll kick over to uh, get some 4D news from Jim Sobchak and Donna Galis in San Jose. And then we'll get the, the, the news from Wakanda from Zhang Yilu. Liu. Uh, sorry. And um, then we'll get the 4D iNug e digest from Ed Hammond. Uh, I'll review some of the recent uh, posts on the 4D blog and the what the blog segment. Uh, we'll check out uh, some of the recent uh, knowledge base articles. Um, and then we'll get to the this, this special topic. We have Ballander Walia joining us from London uh, doing configuration management for IT infrastructure using 4D. Uh, we'll have questions and answers, and then we'll talk about our next meeting, which is on September 26, 2018. Uh, again, my name is Brent Raymond, and this is the 4D and Wakanda user group. Uh, you can see our website at 4dmethod.com and contact 4dmethod at 4dmethod at gmail.com. Um, we get together and do this every, uh, every six weeks to two months uh, to try to bring together a scattered community of developers and users of 4D and Wakanda. We stream all of the meetings uh, via YouTube Live, also known as uh, Google Hangouts, to allow people to participate from anywhere. Uh, we have people today from, from, as I mentioned, England and Belize uh, and the strange land of California and a few other places, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, uh, we record all the meetings and presentations to be viewed again at a later date. They're all available on, on the 40 Method YouTube channel. Uh, and we are attempting to provide fresh new content all throughout the year in between 40 summits and other 40 events uh, to uh, provide content and exposure for users and developers everywhere. So uh, that being said, just a little bit of uh, news from 4D Method. Um, in our last meeting, we had uh, Thomas Mao join us from uh, Germany and give us a really uh, terrific presentation on, uh, on the new capabilities uh, that you can take advantage of with uh, V17, 4D V17 and list boxes uh, using, using Orda and collections. It was really a, uh, an exciting, uh, look at the future of 4D development and 4D user interface uh, uh, creation. Um, getting a little feedback here. I'm just going to mute some people there. Okay. And um, uh, you can see that that uh, presentation uh, on the, the, the link here on this slide uh, and actually take a look at that he shared. Uh, on the 40 method GitHub uh, account uh, is very, very eye-opening uh, to the new ways of, of coding in 40. And I think it was, uh, it, it provided certainly some inspiration because uh, uh, our own Roland Lanuzel from France, 40 France, um, took uh, Tomas's idea and ran with it and uh, redeveloped his own music library uh, and it's just a, a really impressive uh, interface that would have been extremely tricky if, uh, if not just downright um, uh, undoable in, uh, in previous older versions of 4D. And it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a handsome uh, new way to do things. I'd like to just share a little video, uh, if I can, of, of how how it works here, and there's a link to the video on the 4D method, on this post for the 4D method website. And um, excuse me while you have to look at my face here while I fish around for the video. Um, there we go. So, so here it is in action as he's uh, clicking around to the different um, genres of music, scrolling uh, within a, a sort of a text grid view and doing uh, and selecting different artists and having it load uh, 
the albums, uh, uh, album covers in, in various different areas. Uh, you can see the entire list uh, in the lower left and then uh, larger pictures in the right, obviously, and the song list in the lower right. Uh, you can do multiple select uh, and it just provides a very, as I mentioned, a uh, very handsome, very uh, attractive interface um, in, a, in a compact space, one page application where uh, otherwise you would have had to have uh, uh, really um, done some, some heavy trickery to try and, uh, and provide this kind of functionality. And if you're watching in the, at the top bar, um, it's also quite fast despite having uh, a, a, an extremely large connect, uh, uh, collection of music including uh, Harry Connick Jr. Can't get enough of him. So anyway, swi switching back to the, um, the presentation here. Uh, again, my apologies for the close up of my face. Um, but uh, let's see, here we go. Right, so check it out. Uh, I think uh, you might get some inspiration for your own uh, uh, 40 application interfaces. Um, it's uh, it's just a uh, an incredible, incredibly little code which it, it is necessary to create that kind of a uh, uh, that kind of a view. So, um, right. So I'm going to kick it over to uh, to Jim and Donna uh, in San Jose for some of the the news from 4D. Okay. Thank you, Brent. Um, very interesting video there. I like that. I like the eclectic uh, taste in music there as well. <laughs> so, uh, so welcome from the 40 offices here in the uh, heart of Silicon Valley. A little smoky. You've probably all been reading about the fires in California, but uh, we're safe here in this area, but um, the rest of the state is undergoing some, some nasty uh, weather and fire. So anyway, uh, here we are, and I hope everyone's enjoying their summer. Um, it's going by way too fast for, yeah. for my my taste. So as always, thanks to uh, Ed and and Brent for organizing these meetings and for inviting 4D and Wakanda team here. Uh, we certainly appreciate being a part of this. So um, I'd like to introduce Donna Gallus. Um, she's our new marketing field manager here in our San Jose office. Uh, Donna brings a wealth of software experience um, to 4D. We're excited and lucky to have her working here, and uh, she's certainly hit the ground running because we had a lot of things on her plate uh, when she got here. So she's handled them all uh, with aplomb, and she's doing a, a great job. So, Good morning, um, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, Thank you. You're, you're, you're welcome. welcome. And we are looking forward to Ballander's presentation as well. Um, I know several 40 developers who will be interested in this topic, and hopefully they're all attending today's meeting or uh, we'll see it on the YouTube uh, YouTube later, but it uh, should be uh, super interesting. Um, so just a few things on my on, on my uh, page here. So uh, V17, uh, we're seeing a large number of 40 developers downloading V17 developer editions, migrating their V16 um, developer editions to V17. That's a super good sign for us, very positive sign. Um, and our biggest single installation of uh, 4D, whom you all know is in Indiana, they have uh, moved their production server over to V17 already. Uh, they have 660 concurrent users are now running V17 and all early signs are uh, really positive there. So uh, that just shows that the, um, the R release cycle, the agile development we're doing with 4D is, um, is working. So also in addition, we have a couple OEMs who have migrated their users, are in the process of migrating their users to V17. So uh, as the OEM account manager, that uh, is really a good sign for us. So we've never seen this high an adoption rate for a new release of 4D this early in the cycle, a .o release actually being put into production at some really large sites. So that's a, a really good sign. Um, so as far as marketing goes, um, uh, we will continue to put out marketing blasts that describe the new V17 features. We'll be pointing to the blog posts and to summit videos uh, that illustrate each feature, as we have been doing uh, for the past several weeks. So, 
Uh, yeah, so we have an upcoming training I want to announce to um, to you now. We haven't really put it out in the marketing, but I wanted to announce it. It's a it's a 40 essentials training it's for 40 beginners uh, who are new to 40, uh, maybe new to development. Um, the, the class will be October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd here in San Jose. It'll be taught by Angelo Caraprisi from 40 Latin America. Angelo did the same training last year. It was super well received. So we had a lot of people requesting that we do it again. And uh, so we will be doing it again. That's October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in San Jose. It's called 40 Essentials Training. And Angela Caraprisi will be the trainer. Limited seating. And by that, I mean uh, we are definitely limited to 15 people. Um, Angela, it's a hand, hands-on training, one-on-one. -on -one. So Angela actually walks a, around the room and makes sure that everyone is uh, following uh, with his training. So we can't have more than 15, otherwise it doesn't work. So I, I can tell you that we've booked about half the class already before we've even announced it. So if you have any interest in sending someone from your company um, to 40 beginning training, then October 1st to the 3rd are the days to look at. Just contact your account rep and she'll, she or he will be able to help you out with that. Uh, the new website, we're doing, uh, we're making super good progress on the new website. Uh, we know we're late. Uh, we wanted to have it out by the launch of V17. That's not, didn't happen, obviously. But we are planning to release it around the time of V17 R2. So we're not too far away from that. Uh, progress is great. And it's going to be a fantastic thing. We've done and I have seen early. Uh, iterations of the website and looked really good. So I think you'll all be happy with that. So I think that's all for me. Donna, I, I, Donna this is her first time here in the meeting, so I kind of took over some of her topics. Next time she'll be uh, she'll be, be doing that herself. So I think that's all from 40, uh, except for Sean. And uh, Brent, I'll kick it back to you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that um, it, it's exciting that there's a, a new training in October there, and that's in, in San Jose? Yes, that'll be San Jose, just um, a short walk from our office here, literally a, a five-minute walk from the office at the Hyatt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Does that include a, a, a 4D central uh, tour as well? Or sure. It? Yeah, what we do typically is um, uh, 4D provides breakfast and lunch at the hotel where the training is. Then after it's over, we have a, a little soiree here at the 4D office. We, you know, um, beverages and, and uh, snacks, uh, just to congratulate everyone for going through the training and um, and graduating, basically. So, yeah, yeah it does include a, a tour. Great. Sounds great. Oh, that, yeah, that's that's fun. Um, and and uh, I'm sure that's uh, that'd be great for not only developers, but uh, you know, sort of project managers and uh, DevOps people that work with 4D as well, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. we find that the, the most uh, often there, the people that come that are new to 4D are coming from companies that use 4D, and that company may want to move somebody up from, say, IT or um, maybe marketing or, say, into developing. And this is a great opportunity to do that. It's all about uh, learning how to use 4D. And when you come out after three days, you have a really good understanding of the, the basic essentials of 4D. Cool. OK. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, to everyone. Uh, yeah. yeah, and just, uh, I mean, I think the elephant in the room here is, is the V17 release uh, from the, you know, the last couple months. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible. And, you know, we'll continue to, to talk about, uh, technical aspects of, of the new version, but it, it, they are substantial <laughs> and they, they really provide some, uh, some, some slick new ways to, uh, to, to do your, your code and, and provide great, uh, uh, business logic and applications and uh, interfaces. Um, yeah. And, uh, so among, among them, obviously, is the Orda and uh, and a, a, a continuous rollout of, of new 4D Write features, uh, 4D Write Pro, um, new 4D language structures such as the, the for each, and and I mean that's touching parts of 4D that really haven't changed for 20 years uh, or more, 30 years, and um, so it's exciting that they're expanding even the core of the language. 
and uh, and they're with with an eye on keeping the systems all secure. Uh, and R two is already in beta, so they're they're just keep they keep on pushing out the good features. So, anyways, um, I'm going to hand it back over to Zhang to uh, give us a little bit of news from the world of Wakanda. Uh, and here you go. Uh, hand and presentation to you. Thanks, John. Hi. Thanks, Brad. Uh, hi. Uh, the Wakanda team has been really uh, quiet and busy this summer, so we're working actively on our next version. Uh, with their, our new uh, faster release cycle, we typically roll out every version about two to three months. So we I try to incorporate one, two major features. And uh, so in last 2.6.0, we has our Linux support, and it was really uh, well received, especially a lot of uh, users deploy on Linux. Uh, we see a, uh, a lot of adoptions and uh, feedbacks that was going well. So and uh, it's been uh, two months. So the 2.7.0, the next version is around the corner. So I want to uh, give us uh, everyone a little teaser of what's coming. So the this time we're looking at uh, probably uh, two new features. One is the uh, new data browser. As we know, we used to have a, a data browser that was built, uh, built in prototype. And uh, since we uh, uh, since that was that deprecated, we uh, actually wa uh, wanted to bring something to replace that. So this would be the first attempt to replace it with the read-only feature. So now you can see the data uh, without really have to build your own page uh, built in data browser. Uh, and uh, I hope in the next version or so they're gonna uh, keep uh, enhancing that, make it read write, and, uh, and you bring the features that you, that was there back. And the next thing uh, is called the uh, ex exception listener. So this is similar to uh, like HTTP request handler or a login manager, where you set one uh, method or file, if you will, uh, to handle the uh, global errors. So it's very similar to like a 40 on error call, mm -hmm. where you, you just use a, ge a generic uh, handler to handle this. So this is on top of a throw and catch where it's locally in your own code. And this is, well, uh, you can use this to handle the, a bigger scope uh, errors. So you will have a, a ability to do that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, and uh, uh, with the new features come with the uh, uh, bug fixes or the uh, bugs submitted on the uh, uh, GitHub or, uh, or through uh, to Tao. Always or actively working on them and uh, just keep it keep an eye out for the new release and uh, test them uh, if you are waiting for bug fixes. So yeah, that's uh, what I have with the uh, with the development of Wakanda. And at the meantime, uh, our marketing team and the uh, sales teams are uh, working uh, to publish new blog posts, uh, trying to uh, like do our uh, uh, a little more uh, explain explanation training to uh, to uh, promote Wakanda. So here we have uh, we have a new blog post about the data uh, store model and the Wakanda server terminology for people who came either came from 4D world or who uh, just come to the web uh, and Wakanda world uh, brand new. Uh, trying to help them learn uh, what's what's Wakanda. So uh, we're going to uh, keep posting a series of uh, uh, a blog posts explaining everything Wakanda is so starting from the core, the server, the database, and then we're going to move on to the to the rest of the uh, the product. So keep an eye out, and uh, we'll we'll keep uh, we'll uh, update regularly uh, every month or so. I think, yeah. So that's it for me. Thank you. OK, thanks, John. Yeah, and really, everyone uh, um, from the world of 40 and Wakanda, you know, there's, there's some terrific uh, tutorials out there. And, and these blog posts are, are, are great for rounding out your understanding of the uh, application and the development environment, and especially for people who are, uh, who are more on the 4D end of things. Uh, the direction that that they're going, that 4D is going with V17, um, you know, they're they're adopting a lot of concepts or exposing a lot of concepts uh, from that have been in uh, Wakanda for some time. So uh, a lot of these uh, these tutorials might actually not only teach you a little bit about Wakanda, um, but they will um, give you. Uh, some ideas about what's what's up and coming in the world of 4D development, uh, and and how you can 
how you can plan and uh, and start to take advantage of uh, of those kind of approaches. So um, I can really see that there's some great things uh, in in both Wakanda and 4D coming down the pipe. So um, thanks again for uh, a bit of the the news from Wakanda, Jean. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and now we'll have the uh, 4D iNug e digest from Ed Hammond, where he um, he discusses some of the current discussion on the uh, the email list server, uh, where a lot of people talk about the issues that they're having and um, and the wishes about the development uh, environment and, uh, and just the the chatter in the development community. Thanks, Brent. Uh, as always, the uh, INUG is a great uh, source of information, especially if uh, you're working on a particular topic, it may come up. Uh, that happened to me over the last month and a half. Um, and check out the, uh, the uh, uh, digest. Uh, I generally will post a summary of the topics I found interesting on the uh, 4D Method website. So uh, links to some of the threads that I'll be highlighting will be there later on today. And I also encourage you to uh, check out the uh, 40 forums. Um, a lot of times uh, your access to 40 personnel is a lot faster on the forums than it is through an INUG posting because that's uh, a not an official uh, uh, route to 4D. Uh, and with that in mind, I will get to the threads I found interesting. Uh, early on, after our last meeting, there was a, uh, Robert posted a, uh, a question about application metrics and how you measure uh, who's using what within your application. That was a very good uh, discussion on how you can uh, trace through uh, your application features. Um, uh, later on, uh, Chip Scheid had a, uh, a question, just a curiosity, uh, preemptive threads. And that led to uh, all kinds of discussion on how to share information between uh, different threads and how preemptive and cooperative are different or similar um, and best uses of both. Um, Kirk Brooks, uh, thanks Kirk, Kirk for joining our uh, meeting this afternoon. Uh, posted a question about how do you use, what do you use to monitor your offsite servers? Uh, apparently there's a lot of changes in licensing things going on and uh, people had uh, numerous suggestions on how to uh, monitor your offsite servers. Uh, just for information's sake here at AIC, uh, we have a VPN access and we use ARD because all of our servers currently are our Macs. Uh, but uh, Microsoft Remote Desktop works pretty well also. Um, the question that uh, bit me earlier, and I had to find a, a fix for ours, is Dave Nasrallah. New Gmail interface does not render carriage returns as line breaks in 4D plain text emails. Yes, that bit us also, and we had to work around that. Uh, I'm curious to see what uh, Google will have to say about that when he gets a response from their tech support. And finally, uh, Guru Kevin uh, started a thread on automated generation of form variables. Uh, as you can see, a lot of people are using uh, new features uh, in the 16R releases and up through 17. And uh, it's uh, very interesting to see what everybody's into. These are some of the threads I found interesting over the last few weeks. And I hope you'll have a chance to check them out, as well as the uh, INUG and the 4D forums. So uh, that is all. Well, I've got for this month, Brent, it's back to you. Okay, thanks, Ed. Yeah, and um, you know, it's uh, we really appreciate uh, your covering these topics. It would be terrific if anyone in the in the community who's uh, uh, an avid 4D forum person um, had a little extra time to volunteer because you know there's just a, a wealth of information and discussion that that happens in the forum as well. 
Um, so if uh, if you're listening and uh, and you're you're willing to uh, um, collaborate a little bit, you know that that would be a great segment to have for the uh, 40 method meetings. But uh, as usual, thanks again for uh, the review of of the iNug and updating the e digest page on the 40 method website. Um, uh, lots of uh, of great links on there for uh, for review. Okay, so uh, now we have the segment called What the Blog? Uh, the 4D blog has become a very uh, active and central place to see uh, what, what, is, is, uh, what kind of new development, what kind of new uh, capabilities, uh, an example code uh, fit with uh, nice write-ups and, and images for each of, uh, each of their articles. Um, I'd like to again just point out a few that I found interesting. Uh, there's there's too many to mention them all, um, but namely the Orta genealogy episode one uh, article is a, a again a, a deep dive into how you can put Orta to work. Uh, it's it's the first uh, uh, blog post out of three that are uh, that there will be. Um, and it's uh, again from Roland Lenutzel, who's uh, actually uh, uh, a big authority and a driver of of the development. He's a product owner of 4D, and he's uh, he's a driver of the development and and, and how to um, and has been a big factor in, in how uh, to implement these kind of uh, new features. Um, the uh, the 4D for iOS uh, has uh, there's again it's still in preview, uh, but I, I know that in I believe it's in uh, R2 uh, there will be some fresh new functionality exposed with 4D for iOS. Uh, Eric uh, just just put in the um, chat window 4D for iOS. Yep, it's um it's pretty exciting. Uh, if you weren't at the last summit, they um. They ha are integrating a uh, the capability. I believe it's component based, but to generate pure Xcode, uh, pure Swift, uh, and anyone at 4D can jump in and, and clarify. But um, uh, directly from 4D from your applications uh, and and provide some some uh, app some, some functionality out of the box for uh, navigating. Uh, Navigational windows, informational windows, uh, and and the entire uh, app environment. So it's um, it's really exciting. Uh, there's again some good blog posts uh, about uh, what's coming. Also, the blog has um, the the summit video uh, that the the video of the summit presentation on the 4D for iOS. Uh, it's just driving a lot of interest. Obviously, it's going to be a huge thing for all of us uh, once it gets to a mature state, and um, and we can we can really start sharing that with some of our users. Um, it's not no, it's not directly related to Wakanda. However, it is it could be part of a 4D Wakanda ecosystem uh, where you also have a, an iOS uh, app that. Um, that that hooks into your 4D system uh, similarly to how 4D mobile works as a bridge connector to your, your 4D main application. Um, so yeah, reach out to your uh, account managers if you're interested in, in giving that a try and, and getting more detail and, and check it out on the 4D blog. Also, there was a, a, a short write-up about um, Preemptive web services uh, server and client. Um, just talking about uh, how more of the, uh, the the SOAP commands and uh, additional web web client commands are now becoming uh, are being made to be preemptive. Uh, it's huge if you have say uh, an active API or a faceless application where you have a a back office server to uh, to be able to have all of your web connections to be preemptive. Um, I've got that in, in one of my installations, and it is uh, it's really fun to see how uh, how all of your processors can fire up. I mean, it's uh, that is 
that for, for someone that's been in the 4D world for, for so many years, as many years as I have, um, that is uh, extremely entertaining to, uh, to, to really harness the power of, of the, the newer machines with uh, so many processors um, and, uh, and, fire, and, and, and make an API which, uh, which really hums. So check that out. And you know, they're always coming out with, uh, with other new articles about 4D Write Pro, and 40 View Pro uh, that that are are demonstrating the new capabilities that are coming with every um, every release of of those environments. So check it out. The blog is is really been terrific. Uh, you know, I've always been a fan of the knowledge base, but the blog is like um, that, but really nicer delivered, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's um, you know, they're, they're both wonderful, and I'll I'll mention uh, knowledge base as well in a moment. But uh, the blog is available at blog.40.com. Um, and now, what's to know in the knowledge base? Uh, sometimes uh, I'm I'm wondering if I should uh, uh, give this segment a break just because there's a lot of overlap. There is a lot of overlap between the knowledge base and the blog, but there are some some gems and tech tips uh, that, that shouldn't be missed uh, that come out at, on a regular basis at a regular uh, uh, canter coming from the knowledge base. Uh, among them, uh, one of them is, uh, is this one, create a dynamic form with a web area. Again, this is using V17. And uh, for anyone who, again, it has been using, has, is using a 40 application, is used to the, you know, working within the 40 development environment this uh i'm introducing or you know the knowledge base is introducing you to the new way <laughs> of uh of of making forms it's just extremely powerful they're completely generated from code this little code snippet that we have here in the lower left um uh creates a form with a web area uh assigns the uh the actions uh for the form what what, how, you know, how the URL should be loaded, um, what objects are on there, their positions, uh, um, and, and, and the events happen on the form, the form events, all within this little code snippet. So there is, there is actually no form that, uh, that exists to, uh, that you have to create in order to have this flexible little tool. So you can uh, literally create form views, create data views on the fly. And obviously this is a very powerful thing because uh, anything, anytime you're using objects or collections and whatnot, um, they can be also loaded off of disk. So you can, you can have those uh, as, as stored with, with various tweaks uh, in each of your installations. Awesome, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, also of note, uh, there's a, a nice write-up from Jiang on the 40 mobile exchange using collections. Again, uh, you know, I, I've long used objects for uh, passing values back and forth over 40 mobile, uh, and, and this is a demonstration of how collections can be used uh, as well, and it's, it's just an even more powerful approach uh, to, uh, instead of using arrays and, and, and that kind of thing, the various other ways you can do it. Collections are just opening up uh, a lot of new capabilities within the language and, and uh, these kind of uh, uh, environments. And lastly, I'd like to mention before we get to our, our presenter, uh, there's another write-up on um, moving from, migrating from writing SQL in 4D to writing the same functionality with Orda uh, in V17. And it's, it's actually really neat to see uh, how, how uh, the, the SQL expressions equate to Orda expressions. I mean, that's, that's one curiosity. Um, but then once you get down into the nitty gritty, uh, there's uh, some terrific advantages to migrating your SQL to Orda, uh, namely one of them being that uh, uh, Orda is multi-threaded, whereas SQL is not, SQL in 4D is not. 
Um, and there are just uh, some enormous speed benefits to, uh, to, to, to moving to Orta from SQL. Uh, and I'm not just talking about in, in the simpler style of development. Uh, it's, uh, it's the, the performance is, is almost 100 times faster with, uh, with not even terribly large amounts of data. Um, so, you know, check out that knowledge base article. Uh, again, if you use SQL in your systems uh, at, at any rate, um, uh, I think you're going to find a, 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 that you'll be wanting to get on V17 e even sooner now. So, um, so yeah, knowledge base, 4D blog, uh, just a, a gold mine of, of information there. Uh, I, I read it all the time uh, just to keep myself fresh with uh, 40 and uh, 40 development um, and the new capabilities that are coming in the in the newer versions and uh, highly recommend uh, to check it out here and there so um, and now on to uh, our our feature presenter here we have Balander Walia uh, joining us mm -hmm. from from England thanks for thanks for making time uh, to to uh, present for us today um, Val has, uh, he earned a computer science and engineering degree in 1999 and immediately began an uh, almost 20 year career as a 4D developer. Uh, his specializations include 4D web and cloud software development. Uh, he's done work with, uh, among other companies, News Corp, Nikkei Japan, Financial Times, Reed, Elsevier, Health Sciences, Lexus Nexus, HCL America, and more. Uh, <laughs> most recently, Ballander has become a self-described DevOps enthusiast. Enthusiast, depending on where you're coming from. Um, he's uh, focusing on automation of software deployments and the release cycle, and using the best tools and technology to do so. Uh, his LinkedIn summary says, and I like this, uh, I stay hungry and foolish, uh, huh. and his rule of thumb is automate everything step by step. Uh, right? He's uh, he's connecting from London, uh, where he lives with his beautiful family, and he says uh, he he loves what. Well, speaking paraphrasing, loves what I do. Well, the 4D community loves what you do as well, and and thank you for sharing that with us. So I'll I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate everyone. Uh, uh, that's, I'm blushing. <laughs> that's a really nice introduction. Thank you. Well, um, yeah. So um, I don't know how many of you. I, I can see some of you were at the uh, Washington DC summit, and I presented um, an idea that bringing DevOps into 4D world because I have started using it myself. And uh, you know, um, going back 20 years career, and we, we'll look back. What do we do as developers? You know, and uh, I'll share that sort of slide with you guys as well. Again, um, I haven't prepared any presentation for this, but we got plenty of material. So uh, you know, this is what we do, developers. Um, you know, develop. The customers ask for information. Business grows, and we keep. Making changes because of to keep the you know the software up to date and there is not just 4D there is operating system and um, the, most of the softwares are moving to cloud and then you know you have a lot more to do so uh, what do you do uh, you learn the entire uh, you know uh, uh, sort of engineering or you want to stick to 4D or um, you know you, after struggling like for a few years I kind of thought. You know, in other what do, what do the other people do? You know, Java or uh, PHP world. Well, how do they do it? So I learned obviously uh, a lot of automation uh, in as working in different companies. And so the idea came to my mind after the Jenkins uh, summit uh, presentation that why can't we actually automate everything? I just want to uh, create the. Uh, the infrastructure, install, uh, download 40, whatever version is defined. Um, and I just want to, do, want to define in code. And I don't want to do it manually every time I get a customer. So um, anyway, so uh, we've already uh, have a lot of uh, 
material to go through in the summit notes if you have. But I want to more focus on today actually real demo, so you can actually see how we do it, what we do it. So the other thing which really uh, triggered this idea was uh, a tool I've been using on Linux for many, many years called Ansible. And they announced Windows support. So uh, that was really exciting, because that means we do not have to log into Windows machines via uh, remote uh, Microsoft remote, uh, you know, remote RDC and then uh, remote desktop, sorry. And, you know, manually, I, I, I just don't want to uh, log in and uh, you know, do all the day-to-day -day tasks, especially as a 40 developer, we don't have time. And if you hire an engineer, what happens is um, they do all the automation or whatever they can do manually, they keep doing it, and then they are not busy all the time. So you know you have to cross-train your trust staff, or, or the idea is you define a configuration uh, with the help of a consultant or, or yourself, if you know these tools. And they are open source tools. They're pretty, pretty standard and basic these days. Very simple as well. So I integrated these two tool, tools, 4D especially with Ansible. And the result is I came out with this a, a sort of a CMDB, we call it Configuration Management Database, which is a 4D V17 uh, application. If you see my screen. And I thought of defining everything in my database, all my services for all my customers, all my infrastructure, what I want to uh, create when I uh, launch a new customer. I want to keep it up to date. Uh, the TLS certificates need renewal. Uh, and I want to automate everything. I just don't want to do anything manually. So here's the result of that. Um, so just to quickly kind of give you an overview of this application, uh, it's a very, very simple database of um, uh, my services, and I can create a new service. I can name it so I can easily go in and uh, um, assign uh, my configuration. Um, and I would like to uh, you to sort of take a good look at this structure, because this actually explains a hell of a lot of what the, what the system does. So you have services, and you have your stack. So every project, you have some sort of um, you know, you have 40 database, of course, but you have operating system. You have some kind of security firewall on the web. You have Amazon Web Services or Azure. You have, you know, you have a lot of configuration uh, which is defined, which needs to be uh, defined and updated. Uh, so here's a, another good example of what uh, happens on a uh, sort of on a cloud, a 40 application on the cloud. So you have a um, you have a domain, and then you require you know, the DNS updates, if you're updating, and for different customers, you need a new domain every time. So um, so the cloud infrastructure as code allows us to create all of these things via the code, command line or APIs. So this is how everybody uh, do these days in the DevOps world. So I uh, basically uh, started working on this database and uh, started automating just some tasks so one of the tasks, for example, I want to update my 40 database uh, when it's running. And I want to update on all the servers. So one of the customer I have, they have nearly 50, 40 installation in cloud. So they have Windows servers. Um, it's protected by a CDN. Uh, it's Nginx in that case. But you can have any kind of CDN, uh, like Akamai, Fastly, Cloudflare, if you know these guys. Have uh, will protect you from DDoS type attacks, caching, makes it faster if your application uh, can cache, of course. And you have blacklist, whitelist of your uh, which who's allowed to connect. You want to not open your application to the entire internet, the world, for obvious reasons. So there is a multiple level of certificates, password management. Every you know, cybersecurity wants you to um, change passwords every few months, and I just don't want to do it manually. So, um, so far, um, do you have any questions what I'm uh, describing? No, I'm just impressed by the, uh, the, the 50 servers that you're able to <laughs> yes. main maintain with a click. But go ahead. Thanks. OK. So, um, so what I started doing is together uh, putting the list of tasks I do 
uh, in 4D database. So uh, I'll bring that screen in front. And here is, um, as I gave you an example of, I want to update the certificates. And I use Let's Encrypt for my certificates authority. And um, anyone who can allow us to automate can be used. Doesn't matter. Amazon Web Services allow automation of uh, TLS servers. Remember, there may be multiple layers of TLS. And, and the, one of the other thing is, every time you make a change, you have to go and test it. Uh, otherwise, customer will call you, well, my application is not working. And it could be very simple. So we want to, for another reason to automate this, is for consistency, avoid errors. You test it once, you define all of these in your code, and you literally forget. So um, if you have Windows servers, you want to keep them up to date. So I created a task. And I'll go through this task um, with you. So I have, uh, uh, sorry, in it, this case, it's a playbook. Let me go uh, and open up playbooks. So I have, for Windows, uh, I want to keep Windows OS updates and just create a playbook. Uh, and I want to reuse it. So going back to my structure, I have uh, that playbook, which is uh, used up in different stacks. So stack is basically anything, any infrastructure item which will be required by one or multiple customers, uh, be it a TLS certificate, OS, uh, it could be a Linux uh, machine with Nginx in front of 4D for obvious reasons. We use uh, a lot of us now use that. So anything uh, which completes a project and a service to keep it up and running is a stack. So um, so in the stack we can uh, use these playbooks. So if I click on uh, one of the stack, and I just show you uh, an example of a stack. So I have. Uh, a stack which, call, which is called Deploy 4D Cloud App. So what will that do? It will allow me to run playbooks, attach playbooks. So what I'm saying is that we, we, we create your tasks and playbooks once and reuse in multiple projects. Because Windows updates and 4D, 4DC file updates uh, are presumably you have you know, a standard. Uh, the file paths are the same way they are. On Windows and um, and, and these uh, stacks will have instances uh, which are attached to it. So, for example, all the in in one 40 project you might have a Linux box and two 40 window uh, server running Windows server and one mirror one uh, the the actual server. So you have a stack of a couple of servers DNS. Um, as I said in this example, if you are in a corporate world, you will probably have a CDN, some sort of protection firewall in front. And then um, you will have that configuration uh, saved up for uh, as a playbook. So, in a if you go back to a playbook and just look at it, may have certain uh, tasks and it can use multiple tasks. So the way this 40 database works, you can have uh, multiple tasks, and again you can share those. You, if you have a similar task you're doing for one customer. You can repeat. So if I go to task, uh, here is an example of a task I want to do for every customer. I want to copy 4DC file uh, from my uh, GitHub or S3 bucket or local machine. In this case, I will be copying it from my local machine. And here's a, here's a template I will be using for that. And let's go and look at the templates as well. So I'm using process 4D tags to, to process uh, the templates, and the end result is it creates a configuration very specific for that customer. So if we look at that template, uh, win AC2, that's a YAML which creates um, the uh, all the required EC2 uh, parameters, like which network it is, and which uh, region it's going to be. It's in, um, in this case, I have an example of my Amazon I'm creating these in Ireland. So we will be creating those test instances. So, um, so going back to what what we want to achieve is, uh, you know, we want to create the infrastructure and um, and then deploy the code. So we create the infrastructure maybe once uh, or twice a year, and then we want to keep it up to date. But that once, but that. Update must be regular. So every half an hour, you might want to check that 
if your application is running or not. So there's monitoring. You can also include monitoring playbooks and tasks. And it can send you an email if something goes down. And you can do that uh, in a very similar fashion as uh, we've done it here. Um, so actually, let's just try a few things and see what happens. So, um, and that will start to make more sense as well. So I'm going to uh, bring the um, a service which is to launch my 4D app. And I'm going to create a deployment today with uh, my stack, which is already defined. Launch. Okay, so here's a here's a stack I have created, which provisions EC2 instances on uh, Amazon um, web services. It can be Azure. Ansible is very flexible. It can be actually in-house as well. So this demo, uh, I know it's connecting to Amazon Web Services, but uh, it, it can also make your configuration management locally, even your desktop computers uh, uh, on your LAN. So it's not just limited to Amazon Web Services. And um, so let's just create a, a deployment. So I want to launch this, this stack. And see what happens. Uh, actually, uh, so there is a log window which actually in 4D just processes real time uh, what is happening. See if it's okay. So I started to launch some instances here. So uh, as you can see, I have this stack. Uh, which launches the Windows machines, and I can define how many uh, servers I want, and it will it will automatically pull that information and save in a table called instances. So let's go and have a look at that. So I already have some, so we can either wait for these to be ready, or we can just try the existing ones. Um, and I would like to show you um, the 4D demo. Windows. So I have two instances here already, so we can use those to manage configuration. So the next thing I want to do is in a, uh, in a service is launch the stack, create everything I need, and then I want to deploy 4D code, right? So I, my application is up and running, and, and all the code is moved from whether it's GitHub or S3 uh, or your local machine. In this case, it's a local machine. But let's go back. and. Uh, Run that stack. So deploy my. So what this is going to do is um, update the 4DC files from my local machine and HTML content, which is required for my 4D application. We won't be able to see it yet because it's not running. And if I, I just want to make sure. So my Nginx at the front in Linux is, is ready, but it's, it can't find 4D uh, backend uh, server. So it's going to display this error. But uh, once we have the instances and we deploy this, let's see what happens. So in, yeah, yeah. it should automatically um, create the instances and then uh, deploy the code. That's what we are looking for here. And I will bring that machine just to show. I normally do not log into the uh, Windows box via remote desktop anymore because I do it everything in a faceless manner. But I just wanted to show you that the files are getting uploaded. uploaded and, um, in fact, there is a better way. Let's see if the application is back up yet or not. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really whoops, whoops, oh. um, there. <laughs> right. So yeah, just want to um, wait for it to. I think it's it's obviously it's gonna wait until all everything is ready. The stacks can be uh, quite complex. Remember, it's also working out the private network IP of that instance. In Nginx, it's going to say, hey, my backend is there, 40 port is 8080. So all that configuration. So I'm running a MTK web server here in this application, which has a configuration file. And I just want to show you what that looks like. Um, 
So, later. So here it is. It just says my port for this 4D server is uh, 8080, but that configuration file is generated by the playbooks uh, and then uploaded uh, onto the server. Um, let's see if it's worked. Um, so 40 so is generated. generated. Uh, Correct. Yeah, from the correct. templates. I'm just going to restart this because um, sometimes it hangs for some reason, and I have not figured out yet. I think it's the um, Python library, which is uses Ansible uses Python. So you have to install Ansible and then Python, or Python and Ansible on your Mac. Remember, I am controlling these uh, these uh, tasks from my Mac, and I'm talking to a Windows machine. So let me restart and then uh, run that again. So when we do the roll up, rolling updates, uh, so when we want to launch a new version of uh, this app, what we do is we create a new stack. Uh, it creates a staging environment, adds a DNS entry, and tell us, OK, hey, you can go and test it. And then we can just go and uh, change in the configuration in Nginx that now my live app is this. So all of that is uh, automated. So let's just, I have tried this hundreds of times this week, and it does work. <laughs> Let's try again. So I'm just. It's. Oops. Uh, hey, Val. Um, I. Uh... Just it, trying to work with the echo here, and I muted you, so you might have to uh, unmute yourself. Um, if you had any uh, uh, earphones, uh, I'm getting a bit of an echo while I, um, if I, whenever I try and inject a comment. So, okay, uh, yeah, I will. Looks like it's muted. Uh, just to, there we go. Yeah. yeah. I just uh, mute, uh, unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yep. OK. So yeah, what, hey, great. Uh, uh, where was I? What was the last bit which you understood? Oh, I, you were saying uh, it, it worked uh, It worked before. But you know, I was just going to, um, while you sorted that out, uh, comment sure. that it's, it's so uh, mind-blowing how much uh, can be done with these cloud services through scripting using yes. these YAML files and, uh, and, and, wow. and configuration files for that matter. Um, you, can, you can set up an entire uh, company's worth of uh, cloud infrastructure, of, of general infrastructure. I mean, it's all kind of moving in that direction given, right. given how um, easily automatable uh, these kind of setups are. Uh, and and I think you know what what Val is uh, is demonstrating is uh, is even though you you can script all of these uh, infrastructures, it still gets complicated when you have uh, when you have it at a larger scale. So he's using um, 4D as a way to script the scripting. It's a second second layer of scripting. It's an inception scripting. <laughs> Correct, yes. So, um, you know, we have a lot of options that we can use uh, scripting and templating engines open source. But since I was using 40, I had the, the great 40 pro uh, command process 40 tags. But in fact, uh, that's a very good point that all these tasks I can uh, include. And the other thing I can do is in these uh, template, you will see that I can inject 40 tags. So let us uh, let us look at an example here. Uh, template forty cloud page. So in that, I can you can see there's a current version and the current date and time. There are tokens. So if we go and look at these tokens, they're actually just nothing, but they're uh, forty tags. So what's 
happening is it's before it's uploading the configuration, it's using these reusable uh, tokens, injecting uh, them into the template and processing and then uploading. So on the actual, uh, now we have the app running. The, the app is up st uh, uploaded and we're started by 4D. You can see it's in the background, by the way. You won't see it because when we launch um, literally a PowerShell, uh, new PowerShell command, there is a, by default, it, it, if you launch it remotely, uh, then it will launch in the background. So you don't see it unless you uh, have that, um, you shadow the session and you can see the desktop. But anyway, that doesn't matter. But you can see the 4D actually app is up and running, and it says it's deployed at uh, 2054. That is the, I believe, uh, time on maybe on that machine. Let's check what the time is. Anyway, it's just updated because I will update again and just to prove this, and it will update the HTML content again. Um, let's do that. So uh, all these stacks, they form a service, and then you can reuse them in a in a in an order you want, and each stack can be uh, executing playbooks and tasks in different order. So even if it's the same playbook reused, you can you can launch you can execute in a different order. So as you see, it has uploaded the the content. It should update this again, the version number, and that shows that it has um, talked to that server using WinRM, uploaded the 4DC files, and restarted. So I can actually restart as well in the same fashion. Um, so let's see what else we got here. Um, I mean, I have lots of examples of where we renew the um, the TLS certificate, for example. I have for all the domains. I have a playbook which just in you know goes through all the servers and uh, um, renews them. So if we launch this, um, you mentioned you use AWS for generating uh, TLS certificates, or do, are you using Acme? Uh, I'm using Let's Encrypt in this case, but you can use uh, AWS uh, Certification manage Manager or anything else, really. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we we don't need to go and even look at it again. Once it's set up, uh, so I have, uh, I did show this before, but I have nearly 500, nearly 500 domains which use uh, the, uh, the Let's Encrypt to, to automatically renew. Remember, the certificate layer is not only at the, um, the the front the front end, it's also at the um, uh, at the the second layer. So if we switch back to my this this layer here, so we have a TLS cert between the browser and the nginx or the CDN at the front, but there's another TLS uh, optionally. So you encrypt the traffic between 40 instances and the front end CDN layer, if you want to. So that's what we are doing. So we are automating the uh, the renewal of those certs as well. So if you click on any of this domain, uh, Apex domains without dub dub dub, uh, it has actually 500 domains, but they're all uh, generating two certs per domain. So one is Apex domain, one is with dub dub dub, one is without. But all of these thousand certs, I don't have to care about it. But once it's defined, the same playbook will go off and pull the new cert, and it will it will uh, if it needs renewal, it will renew it. Wow, that's a, right. an incredible amount of automation. Yeah. So if you have um, a new server, which for any reason you destroyed your old server and you have to uh, you know um, uh, launch the entire stack on a new server, you literally can just go in in a service and click a button. And say you know build my application um, in a different region. Uh, maybe you know you're moving, migrating. Uh, remember migration. You know migrating, a migration to another um, Amazon regions or availability zones for scalability. It's a constant thing. So you know you will need the TLS again. You will need the OS again. You will need to keep the OS up to date. Actually, that's one more thing I wanted to show. Um, so I have a stack to keep my Windows servers perform Windows updates. So let's see. Um, 
Actually, this is hanging for some reason. If I restart, let me restart and rerun. So it will show you it's performing Windows updates. And if it will need to reboot, it will close for the application. And it will reboot if it has to. So let's try that. The application is uh, still running on my uh, remote machine. And I'll wait for the 40 to come back again. Let me start again. It hasn't launched for some reason. So, so any questions so far while I'm waiting for 40 app to start? Just to comment that um, so Ballander showing how uh, how this automation can be used between uh, uh, different remote installations. Uh, you know, someplace like here at the uh, the Art Institute of Chicago Museum. Um, you know, it would be a, a, a very useful approach uh, given the just the vast number of servers that we host locally. Um, right. and, and uh, to be able to perform uh, upgrades and maintenance on uh, and restarts on all of those machines and, and renewing certificates and, and whatnot uh, uh, just purely through click of a button automation. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a whole department worth of people right there. <laughs> yes, and the other thing is that whatever the uh, policies are, whatever the requirements are, um, you know, you change password every six months, three months, whatever. So here's a, here's an example. By the way, I'm running a playbook to update my operating system. So if it does require a restart, it will. And if it doesn't, it will just update. Anyway, so um, yeah, so all these uh, policies you have in, in enterprise or in your business security, you can define all this in a code, in a database, effectively in a 40 database. and. And I also have another um, uh, option here in the services, actually. Um, if, you, if I just double click on one of the services, I can say, uh, when am I, whenever my 4D background process is executing, run it. That means every hour there's a, a housekeeping process which runs. It will just run those stacks uh, for me. So keeping the, uh, the TLS certificates up to date um, and uh, anything else I have in that stack destroying any old instances we're not using. Remember, uh, cost is very important on the cloud because you may have orphan or uh, load balancers or EC2 services or even storage S3 or, or volumes sitting there costing backups. One of the things we do is backup actually automated. I, I can't show you that account here but in this one, but we have snapshots created every hourly or uh, well, depending on the customer, uh, you know, whatever the requirements are. So all of that is done uh, in, in automated fashion. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to see uh, how much you, you know, at, at what scale you've been able to deploy 4D solutions in the cloud, in the AWS, and then to not only, uh, you know, leverage the, the, the cloud, but also to manage all of those installations uh, and all of the, the maintenance and upkeep and, and de deployment of those applications with 4D. So it's, a, it's 4D literally from end to end. Absolutely. And you see on my screen, I have one change in the Windows updates. And this, this will be actually saved in my 4D uh, playbook runs. I have a log table where I can go and see uh, which, uh, which service ran which playbook and what it did. In fact, let's look at the Let's Encrypt if uh, we have anything exciting, if any certificate expired and we renewed it, auto it renewed it automatically. I mean, I literally didn't have to even worry about TLS search for nearly a year now. Uh, you know, I, I just, um, yeah, um, if there is an, obviously a, an issue, um, I can set up it to alert me. I can set up alarms if you're using AWS or Azure. You can set up alarms using 4D. Um, so you can just create a playbook. Hey, you know, create this alarm when this goes down. Um, you, you know, you're you're using the most of the cloud, uh, and the most important is using 4D. You can uh, this database. You can actually reuse your 
man hours. Remember, these things take hours and hours initially. But that's my point is that you're saving your cost for your company, your business, your, your customers. You're creating this automation to um, have less sleepless nights. So, um, and, and one more thing, it, on Windows it creates a PowerShell. Um, this database automatically creates PowerShell using Ansible. And on Linux it creates a bash file, remotely uploads it, runs it. So. Um, well, and it, it's it's not only the automation; it's it, it's the uh, oversight of the uh, of the maintenance and the state of of the installation, so that right. you know, right. it's very easy. Obviously, with these logs and uh, uh, with uh, the the tracking that that your application uh, um, keeps from all of the the scripts, uh, that uh, that would very easily be able to be displayed via a dashboard for the on the client side to say you know what maintenance what maintenance has been done recently you know what version of everything am i running you know ha, are, is is the vendor doing the job that you know that we ask um, right. which which would otherwise have to be done all done manually and uh, could quite yeah. easily get out of control absolutely so you know the the benefits are. I mean, I can't wrap them up in a in a one session, but um, hopefully you get the idea that um, you know what what the power of this system is, and having a database with integrated with these automation. Uh, so I just updated that forty app. Hopefully, if we go back to our browser, it will show a new time. Uh, okay, it's. We, uh, we had a question from Eric. Uh, he said, yeah. "How are you automating?" the cron actions in 4D? Well, again, there is uh, no need to do that in 4D, uh, because in your playbook, you can just create uh, whatever cron jobs or scheduler on window you want, and um, uh, 4D will run that playbook. Because we are, remember, we are using underlying Ansible, which already has that module. So if you, um, if you ever need sort of a, a new playbook or a task, you probably can find uh, there's already one somebody has written. So if we go uh, just search for Google Ansible Chrome module, uh, and you can actually write module in, in uh, 4D as well, because Ansible exchanges um, and works with any other application using JSON, so which 4D can easily work with. And as long as you are um, you're able to parse and uh, create JSON, you can work with this. So it's, it's pretty simple and easy. Most of the time, you'll find everything is already somebody has done, and there's an example available online. Uh, so here's an example of a Chrome. Check my directories uh, every hour. I, every uh, runs of two and five exist. OK, so it's just a, uh, if I go to Chrome Guru, it will tell us. So every hour, whatever it is. A re reboot. Uh, you know, you can create a job, which will reboot and do specific uh, housekeeping. Alert if the disk is full. How many times the site has gone down? Just so somebody didn't realize the database has used up all the space, temporary logs and sessions on the web. There is another. You know, if you have the logs enabled on your servers, it will uh, it will uh, you know use up all your space. You won't even know it. So. These kind of things. Um, so yeah, it, it's, the chances are there's a module already available. Oh, that's great. So this this uh, this should have updated the HTML file for my app. And um, if we go back, it takes a little while. But if we go back, ah, there you go. So you see the time changed here. It was. Uh, Different time before, and it just changed. So my application, uh, which is a dynamic application in this case, uh, but this page is actually itself just a HTML page generated uh, uh, on local my local Mac uh, using 4D CMDB demo, and it's uploaded just to show you that it's updating the files. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty much it. But there is no limit to what you want to do with it. You know, this is just what I am doing with it. But there is. There's a lot more you can do. Uh, it seems like um, uh, it's so powerful in combination with uh, Ansible. Uh, 
you know, 40 and Ansible and the, and the, the process 40 tags, which is essentially replacing placeholders in the uh, Ansible scripts. Correct. Um, uh, you know, for for manipulating uh, in, installations at such a uh, a large scale, it's uh, just in, incredible. Uh, I, you know, I, I would say it again. I mean, w with this tool, I mean, you're literally uh, doing what a whole department full of people yeah. uh, you know, traditionally awesome. would would be tasked with. Yeah, that's the secret I was hiding, but you got it. You know. Uh, <laughs> That people, you know, this kind of thing will be done by whole team. There will be the other thing is, you know, the uh, obscurity of this. So you can actually encrypt the passwords and things in 4D as a blob, and you can say, don't ever will reveal this. You know, even the information saved in database, which is what I'm working on next, is uh, passwords and keys management. So you just, you know, even if somebody gets hold of this database, you know, you just want to make sure you're protected, your business is protected. So it's more obscure. So things like, uh, so if we look at a, um, let's uh, look at a EC2 uh, playbook which creates Windows instances. Um, and actually, I will show you on my terminal. This is using a um, underlying role. So by the way, you can download these roles from um, Ansible Galaxy. So I will show you that. Uh, this one. Hold on a second. I always wondered. I keep meaning to to look it up on Wikipedia or something. If uh, if the, the the name for the Ansible project came from uh, the Ender's Game. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it yeah. Uh, conceptually fits. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the point I was making here is that you have your security group, your subnet. What what you want to protect what ports are open. You don't want anybody to even know what that is. So you're, 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 you've created that, but you know the, the, the master uh, sort of architect level person who's in charge of 4D created that in, a, in AWS. And you're just reusing them and hiding that from uh, people who just, uh, maybe developers who don't need to know. They just need to update the app. So you can create this sort of layer an interface in 4D, if I have the users and groups, obviously, I, this is a demo. In the real system, we have users and groups. So it's hooked up with the, uh, the, uh, active, account, the active Directory, LDAP. And what it does is it only lets you play the playbooks which you really uh, have access to at the current time. So you can't really know what the ports are open, what port is running on. You, you don't need to know. And you're hiding all the infrastructure from developers. And that's not the best use of time for the developers. They should just focus on what the customers want, and uh, we should repeatedly use that. So that was the idea of DevOps, and you know, kind of reusing your uh, your engineering and software skills, which are uh, not very easy to find in my uh, 4D Summit session as well. So you know, you're a winner from every point. So uh, yeah, it really helps in this because you're you're you're. Uh, you're, you're creating your um, uh, effectively your business configuration. That's what I call a business and security configuration, and um, and you're hiding from uh, anyone else. And 4D is, you know, by nature, uh, not many uh, sort of uh, on the internet can hack into it. That kind of thing. So it really works really well. Uh, Ed was just asking if that was a Windows 10 virtual machine. Uh, oh, actually, it's a very good question. It is uh, Windows. Um, let me go in the console. Actually, uh, that will tell me. And that's Windows. The AMI is uh, I'm using is Windows Server 2016. Ah. So you define what the um, the other thing is. What like 40 licenses every time you. Install a new machine. First thing you will need to do is like install licenses, and they might expire. You have to update. So all of that you can sort of uh, either bake it into your uh, image on the Amazon uh, if if the licenses are sort of standard licenses uh, needs to be installed at the start as a default, and then you know, and then on a regular basis you can create a playbook. Hey, update this customer's license every year. 
and uh, you just go and you go and change in your 4D database. That's all you have to do, and it will keep it up to date. So things like that, which on practical terms are what 4D developers end up doing, and then there is an error; it doesn't work. So once you you know you've defined a tested working in your code, your infrastructure as code, you literally can just forget about it. You know, anybody in an admin person in your business can do that. That's awesome. Um, well, cool. Uh, I mean, it's just a, uh, a very powerful approach, and you know, your uh, secret of automation is safe with the uh, safe with the user group and all of our uh, viewers on YouTube. So, okay. Well, <laughs> I don't mind. I'm using a lot of open source. I mean, this might actually bring uh, you know new ideas and and some new, hopefully, new business for uh, for the as well. So, which we uh, really absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's 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 really uh, terrific. I know you're not the certainly not the only person um, running 4D from the cloud, um, but it's 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 just great to see how uh, how 4D itself has been able to supercharge your uh, your deployment of 4D solutions in the cloud. Right. Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The real power. You will see when you have multiple clients and you're using this in real world on a daily basis and your support team can do backups and things with the click of a button, then you will start to realize the real power. I mean, it's very hard to you know, kind of do, cover everything in a session, but yeah, I would like to do more and maybe you, know, you guys tell me what else would you like to see automated and I can write, sit down and uh, uh, write it playbook and uh, and uh, show you next time yeah no that that would be great I mean it's um it's a it, it's a lot to cover in one session you almost are forced to uh, to think of it in high level terms of uh, of, of what Ballander is trying to uh, what he's accomplishing which is uh, you know a massive amount of, uh, of uh, maintenance and oversight of all of these installations um, uh, Kirk mentioned, uh, how about a session devoted to setting up 4D on AWS, which I would be keenly interested in as well. Okay. So yeah. uh, just so I'm clear, so it will create a uh, EC2 instance Windows machine, and it will uh, install your application from where GitHub or your local machine or... Uh, well, that would be great. And, and also just any secrets that you have or any any sort of uh, power tips that you have for making sure that um, 4D runs like it should uh, right. uh, on AWS as well, and then the automation aspect of that is is just becomes icing on the cake. You know, it, it, uh, no. I think this is this is mm -hmm. what Definitely I details. <laughs> sorry, uh, yeah, this is what I was trying to show anyway. But I think if you, if Cur if you can provide me with a the application. So with everything you have, like maybe a web folder, uh, all the resources, everything, so we'll create a new machine and upload that and have that page up and running where it says uh, Hello World or whatever. Um, so yeah, um, absolutely. Now I can very, uh, very much uh, do that. So yeah, I like that. That would be fun. Yeah, no, that's... Um, yeah, very impressive. Uh, so thanks again for for setting aside uh, time to uh, to show it off. And I know that um, you know you, you showed off uh, uh, a lot of this at the summit. But you know, like it, it's just great to be able to uh, continue the dialogue and and take a look at it a little bit deeper. Uh, uh, you know, once uh, once we've had a, a first view at, at the summit with your summit material. So. So thanks again for sharing this with the community. It's great to see 4D's role that it, you know is playing in the cloud for you, and uh, um, look forward to the the next uh, session uh, where we where we dive deeper into uh, you know doing it from scratch, and uh, and, and and which I think uh, a lot of people will uh, be able to relate to. They'll they'll be just stepping into uh, hosting their applications on the cloud. Okay, how about we do a one-on-one next time? So you guys actually will do it while where I am doing it here, and we will just every step will do it. Yeah. One, and then we have enough time to do it anyway. So we. Nice. we uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do it live. <laughs> so if you, if you, yeah. If you do get ready with your applications, just to package them ready, compiled to be deployed. You don't have any infrastructure. Get everything you, you, you your licenses, everything ready. I mean, I'm just using a demo version of 40 anyway. I don't have even NTK license here. Um, just, but yeah, that will be uh, awesome. Remember uh, the company I mentioned, Synergist. They use this system within from their own CRM system, which is automating everything of that, including licensing, DNS management. Uh, when they have a new customer, it creates the infrastructure and uploads the code from uh, the, wherever the latest package file is. So it's already kind of there, but we should do it. Uh, everybody should do it, yeah, as a one-on-one, -on -one, I think. Then it will uh, be a lot more fun. Yeah, no, that would be very interactive and uh, and uh, I, I, I'm getting uh, sounds good off of the uh, YouTube chat window as well. So. Uh, again, yeah. Thanks, thanks again for uh, for your terrific pre presentation. I'm just gonna mention that um, uh, you can check out the 40 method uh, schedule on on our website. Um, uh, on Wednesday, September 26, uh, we're gonna be having uh, Kirk Brooks, who's uh, with us today, to talk about subforms as dynamic data objects, uh, rethinking the 40 form. Um, uh, Kirk, would you mind uh, saying a little bit about your, your next presentation? No. <clears throat> hey, Brent. I'm, uh, am I coming through okay? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, I was, uh, you know, if um, Belinda just was uh, sailing us through the clouds at about 40,000 feet, um, I'm going to put us in a dose dive down to about crop duster level and talk about. Uh, yeah a lot of the work I've been doing with uh, what's turned out to be dynamic forms. Uh, I started by taking my presentation from DC, which focused on inherited forms, moving it over to right. V17. <clears throat> and then that was working. And then I started adding a few things from V17. So I rewrote it once. And then I started to really understand how uh, the form variable works and all the stuff that order brings to working with form objects. So I rewrote it again. Uh, and then I started to uh, realize how much more effective it would be instead of using like subforms or inherited forms to put all this into a dynamic form that you populate a subform with. So this will be the uh, fourth rewrite. It may be the fifth rewrite by the time we actually get there. Uh, the focus being on just these incredible new tools that we have for working with forms, for working with dynamic data, for um, implementing a comment that Thomas Mall made in his presentation about using the database as a variable and a variable as a database. And the form is a place that 4D has always had, frankly, too much um, programming and operating going on, going on in. But with the ability now to just link that flexibility of working in a form with uh, actually tying into the data, it's very powerful. I'm going to take a little subset of that. I'm going to focus on uh, making toolbars and how you can do those on the fly. You can build them to make a nice, pretty interface. Uh, they, are, they are built from dynamic forms, which you can either, again, build on the fly. You can build them and save them. Uh, it's just a, it's a great tool and it's very exciting and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing it with you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, that's uh, such a, a great new capability to be able to, to generate the forms via code and, um, and then combining that with uh, sub forms and um, a, a sort of generic approach to interfaces. It's going to be, it's going to be exciting. So thanks for, uh, thanks for preparing that for us. Thank you again, Ballander, for, uh, for, nice. For doing this demo um, and looking forward uh, very much to, uh, to to taking another look from the ground up. Um, yeah, any if we have any other questions or discussions, uh, again, all feedback is appreciated uh, to make uh, to make these uh, meetings and and recordings more relevant and helpful for people. Um, you can support 40 Method in, in other ways uh, via Patreon. Check it out, and there's a few. Uh, uh, nice reward levels there. Um, otherwise, uh, I don't see any other comments. Um, 
we'll see you all in the next meeting. Uh, so thanks for joining. And um, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Th thanks, everyone at 4D. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.